I wonder what Jeffrey Tubin is doing right now. <laughs> I think we're live. Oh, we are. So we're going to let uh, people uh, come in, wander in for a few minutes. The numbers are climbing, and then we're going to begin. Again, we're waiting a little bit for more people to arrive. Are we audible to the audience now or? Yes, we are. Yeah. So, Welcome to On the Park Bench, a public square conversation. It's brought to you by the Congress for the New Urbanism. On the Park Bench presents interactive conversations with thought leaders in new urbanism and allied industries, providing an opportunity for the audience to engage in real time. The webinar series is intended to be a platform for CNU members to engage, debate, and collaborate on the pressing and emerging issues that we're all facing right now. Let us know if you'd like to hear about something or from someone, and we'll try to line it up in a future webinar. Today's conversation is our inaugural Authors Forum uh, webinar. Um, it's, it's on the book, Architecture in the City, with author Michael Dennis and speaker interviewer Dan Solomon. Authors Forum on Urbanism is a monthly series featuring authors in an hour long interactive discussion of recent publications on urbanism. The producer of this series off the camera is urbanist and architect Duru Tadani. The Authors Forum on Urbanism will be held once a month on Tuesdays from 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, next. So you can share your thoughts on, on the park bench. Uh, there is the URL. Next. And you can register for our next Authors Forum on Urbanism, which is going to be held Tuesday, December 8th at, again, 12 p.m. Eastern time. And it's going to be on the book Space and Anti-Space, The Fabric of Place, City, and Architecture. Um, with authors Barbara Littenberg and Stephen Peterson and interviewer Philip Langdon. And you can register that at cnu.org resources on the park bench. Next. So my name is Rob Studeville. I'm senior communications advisor and also editor um, of the online journal on the um, uh, public square, um, a CNU journal. And uh, with us today um, is Michael Dennis, who is the author of Architecture in the City. Um, many years ago, Michael was at Cornell in, in Ithaca, New York, my home city, and uh, now Michael is Professor Emeritus at MIT and author of Court and Garden, From the French Hotel to the City of Modern Architecture. Joining Michael Dennis is Dan Solomon, an architect based in San Francisco, who is principal at Methune, an architecture and urban design firm. Dan is also a co-founder of CNU and an author, and his most recent book is Love Versus Hope, housing in the city. Recently, an entire journal publication was dedicated to Dan's book, um, and that included an essay by Michael Dennis. Next. So Architecture in the City um, is comprised of essays and articles written from 1977 to 2020, and it argues for the re reconnection of architecture and landscape as a function of the city. It also makes a strong case for the environmental imperative of urbanism. On the cover is an aerial photograph of Florence, Italy. 
So both Michael and Dan will present and then they will have a back and forth discussion and then we will go to Q&A. Uh, so please use the Q&A function of Zoom to ask questions as they occur to you. Without further ado, I'm gonna pass this along to Michael Dennis. Okay, thank you, Rob. And thank you, Diru, if you're listening. Thanks to CNU and especially to Dan. Uh, it's a bit of a challenge to talk about a book that no one has seen or read, except perhaps Dan and I. Um, so I thought I would start, let me share the screen here. going the wrong way, sorry. Start over again. There we go. Ah. How do I go back? So I thought I would start with a Whitman sample box of contemporary architectural chocolates. These are these buildings, these projects are probably much admired by contemporary architecture students. I might have even been enthused about them when I was a student, had I seen them. But my book is not about this and it's not against these per se. It's about architecture as an integrated part of the city. Uh, the book has <clears throat> excuse me, the book has very personal underpinnings. Um, I grew up in a detached one family house in a small Texas town. In architecture school, I learned to design freestanding modern buildings. There was no discussion of urbanism at the time and no courses about urbanism. Uh, by the time I graduated from architecture school, I had lived in Sherman, Texas, Austin, Texas, Fairbanks, Alaska, and Eugene, Oregon not a real city among them. Afterward, with a travel scholarship, I went to Europe. Can you imagine arriving in Paris, France from Sherman, Texas or Eugene, Oregon uh, to discover a real urban city with integrated landscape, etc.? Or then arriving in Florence to discover urban architecture, architecture in, integrated into the city, a city with almost no freestanding buildings. I can assure you that this, the Uffizi and the Palazzo Vecchio in the background, which is this building right here, we had nothing like that in Sherman, I can tell you, and certainly nothing like the Pitti Palace. This fantastic uh, connection of urban elements, the, the Vasari Corridor, a church, and the bridge, the Ponte Vecchio and the Uffizi and the Palazzo Vecchio were astounding to me that architects could in fact adapt their buildings to help form the spaces of the city. We didn't have that either in Sherman, Texas. So that forms the first uh, uh, article in the book uh, about the Uffizi and that corridor. Um, Florence was remarkable to me also in that there were virtually no freestanding buildings. Only the baptistry and the Duomo or the cathedral were the only truly freestanding buildings. Today, with towns and cities, you could probably imagine the reversal of that. There are almost no contiguous buildings. So in pursuit of urbanism and urban buildings, I sort of uh, fell into or discovered the French Hotel, which was interesting because it had a different kind of composition from, it was anti-classical and anti-modern at the same time. And yet it was a way of uh, um, doing a flexible planning system that could make urban things and private accommodation at the same time. Uh, in another way, it's, um, English cousin, the L London townhouse, uh, 
was inseparable from urbanism. It formed the streets and squares of Georgian London. And you can't really imagine these townhouses without their urban uh, connections, their, the streets and the spaces that they align on. This is in some degree of contrast to the French hotel, which you see on the upper right hand side. Finally then, and these are the first three, <coughs> excuse me, first three articles following the Uffizi uh, article is uh, about the Venetian facade. Uh, to me, the Venetian palace is to the art of the facade as the French hotel is to the art of the plan, the quintessential level of achievement, professional achievement. So these chapters then in the book are followed by a series of others, articles or chapters highly illustrated, focusing on various aspects of urbanism and design. So Dan, over to you. Before um, we get into our discussion of the ideas in architecture in the city, I want to thank Mike on behalf of all of us uh, for the gigantic effort to create this book over a long period of time. It's an artifact that I will cherish as I cherish few other things. My wife, my car, maybe a few other people and a few other artifacts. It's a real treasure and it's a house of treasures. <clears throat> a big part of the content of the book is the beautiful physical artifact of the book itself. Every page is beautiful, every drawing is beautiful, the prose is beautiful, 280 pages without a single clumsy sentence. Mike is telling us that one of the joys that great urbanism provides for us is its splendor, pure aesthetic pleasure. Not to embrace that pleasure is to be a Philistine, and to miss out on one of the best parts of being human like never listening to music. I think Mike's role is like that of a great musicologist who reveals the secrets and the intricacies of Bach to those who might otherwise not hear them or appreciate them. But it's not only the secrets and the intricacies that Michael reveals, he reveals the magnificence, the sheer sensual beauty Without court and garden, and now without architecture in the city, to reveal the secrets of the French hotel, the knowledge, that knowledge of the art of the architectural plan at its most virtuosic would simply be lost. Similarly, the splendors of George and London, the Venetian facades, and the other subjects of loving chapters. So thank you, Mike. Thank you for this huge enrichment to our lives and our knowledge. I know I'm not the only one who will retrieve it from my shelf from time to time just to savor it. Mike has bravely attempted the kind of book that many of us attempt, but few succeed at. He succumbed to the temptation or the neurotic compulsion late in life to create an autobiographical anthology, a summation of everything he has done and learned and thought over a long lifetime. Very few of us have a life story that constitutes a coherent narrative. Mike is an exception. If you string together everything he has ever thought, everywhere he has ever taught, everything he has been moved by over 50 years or more, it makes sense, it makes a good book. It has an ending that grows seamlessly from the beginning and parts that are part of something. A life well, a life lived, a life well lived and lived with purpose to define, refine and pass on to others a grand idea. To do justice to his endeavor, I think it's important and fair not to mix up Mike with his great mentor, Colin Rowe. I suspect it was Colin who discovered the path and pointed Mike along it, but Mike denies this. But it was Mike who made the journey, who fleshed out the map with study and exploration that neither Colin nor any of the other brilliant road disciples and acolytes had the patience, the persistence, and the sheer talent to produce, to produce what one can call 
I think, a masterwork. In preparing for this morning, I admonished myself not to just gush about his book, but I'm afraid I just did gush. So my apologies to the audience, and I promise to be more critical in a few minutes. <laughs> Back to you, Mike. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you, Doubly. Uh, okay. This is where we uh, have a slight diversion of opinion. Uh, uh, it's difficult for me, at least, to uh, disagree with Dan's introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, flattered at the uh, description. Uh, <clears throat> to me, it's now clear, however, that uh, we are in a very serious, unprecedented environmental predicament, <clears throat> the sixth extinction. There have been five previous extinctions of life before there were humans. This one is caused by we humans. Global warming is not the only environmental issue today by a long shot, but it is the elephant in the room. And we're already past the tipping point. But scientists say that if we exceed an increase of two degrees centigrade, global warming will become unstoppable, resulting in catastrophic, unmitigated disaster. You can see where we are right now. And if it continues as projected, we're going to pass two degrees of centigrade increase over pre-industrial levels uh, by 2050, if not 2030. So we have very little time to act and change this. Uh, fortunately, this is something that architects and urbanists can do something about. It is, in fact, central to what we do because all of these problems are a result of the way we live. We need to drive less, consume less, live smaller, and more, compact, more compactly. And this is a major challenge due to the form of our towns and cities. This little diagram right here uh, is to me the problem of American towns and cities. If you go back to the beginning of the uh, beginning, the middle of the 19th century, the great uh, landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted uh, proposed that begrudgingly, I think, that we needed dense uh, town centers or downtowns. Uh, for business purposes, but that we should live in the forest, in the landscape beyond it. And he built parkways to get out uh, to these uh, external uh, houses, single family houses. It's important to note that two thirds of Americans live in detached single family houses. And you can see in the upper right here, a photograph of Boston with commuters coming in from the south and there's an equal condition like this uh, from the north. 66%, uh, two thirds of Americans live like this. And like this, this is America coast to coast outside the major centers. Um, this is Hot Springs, Arkansas, by the way. Uh, this graph clearly illustrates to me at least um, the proportions of energy and carbon produced by the way we live. And you know that it's, to say the, state the simple facts, burning fossil fuels produce carbon, which produces global warming, which produces all kinds of other uh, disastrous things. So two thirds of America lives in households like this, uh, that use this much carbon, uh, this much energy and produce this much carbon. Uh, on the other hand, one third of Americans live in urban conditions like these. Dan and I in San Francisco and me in Boston live like this. We're this green urban single family attached thing. And, and the use, the energy use and production of carbon drops again uh, when you go to urban multifa <coughs> multifamily housing. It's, I think interesting to point out that European towns and cities and villages for that matter are all urban. They're, they're not composed of 
freestanding one family houses with a downtown uh, in the center. Uh, a comparison of Atlanta and Barcelona uh, illustrates the point. They're both have populations of just a little over 5 million people. And uh, the urban area in uh, Atlanta is 4,280 kilometer, square kilometers. And in uh, uh, Barcelona, it's 162. If you look at the emissions, uh, it's 7.5 tons and 0.7 tons for Barcelona. So there's a kind of connection between the data and the way we live. And it's going to mean if we're going to solve the problem, we have to think of a new way to uh, organize ourselves. Another comparison is uh, formally is a uh, uh, Bordeaux and Hudson Yards in New York City on the right hand side. These are both, both of the plans are at the same scale. One of them, architecture has hegemony over the city and the other one, the city has hegemony over the architecture. And I would argue that architecture and education need to be reformed if we're ever going to be able to deal with the problem. And I think that's what the book is about, and I see this chapter, which Dan is probably going to dispute, being integral to the first parts. Um, and it's up to us to make, not only solve the problem, but to make it beautiful and uh, joyful and livable at the same time. So Dan, back to you. Okay. <clears throat> uh, for those of us who know him, or those of us, many of us, who hold dear their old dog-eared copies of Court and Garden, Michael Dennis, the urban esthete, is no surprise. And the first 221 pages of architecture in the city are what he's always been. Good old Mike, the passionate advocate for the intelligence that creates a fragile, subtle, hard-won equilibrium between the private needs and desires of people in the public realm of the city, the physical manifestation of our shared humanity. What is something of a surprise, at least it was to me, is the Michael Dennis of the 12th chapter, pages 222 to 260. New Mike, a passionate and well-informed environmentalist reacting with eloquent panic, to the Malthusian apocalypse that is nearly upon us or is upon us. I would venture to say that Mike's purpose in writing the book is to argue that old Mike and new Mike are really the same person and that new Mike's concerns necessarily embrace those of old Mike. What one might call the dialectics of old Mike and new Mike are at the heart of the book. The attempt is to make the case that a lifetime of love and study of the splendors of world urbanism is crucially relevant to address the environmental calamity. I'd say that the weakness of the book that has no other weakness is that this claim of acute relevance remains a mere assertion without rising to the level of an argument. All the data in the handsome but largely incomprehensible graphs and charts of chapter 12 make a convincing case that he just has that dense cities are the only choice for human survival. But there is no convincing argument that the brilliant and beautiful resolution of the conflicts between private and public, the subtle resolutions of this conflict that old Mike has so lovingly cherished and documented are really a necessary part of the survival imperative. The new Mike of chapter 12 is like a five-star chef arguing that an exquisitely refined cuisine, arguing for an exquisitely refined cuisine on nutritional grounds. Not that it is intrinsically good, but that it's good for you. That's a fine thing to assert, but it's a tough case to argue. For many of us, the assertion is good enough to love your book, Michael, but we are left with the disquieting thought that the concluding chapter is missing. 
that chapter, cue for the slides. Margaret, if you want to start the slideshow, wrong slideshow, there we go. That chapter could be called environmental urbanism and it would have formal analysis and aesthetic pleasure like the French hotel chapter, but directed at the morphological impacts of transit, sea level rise, of stormwater management, of waste collection, of energy, energy generation and the like. Unfortunately, there are only a few candidates in the world for inclusion in this chapter, perhaps none more complete than the Hammerby di district of Stockholm. As more Hammerbys are built in the world, maybe Mike owes us, and maybe Mike owes himself, yet another beautiful book. Perfectly timed to end at the right moment. Okay, thanks, Dan. Uh, I, Dan, this is a surprise for you. Uh, I don't agree with you about Hammerby. Uh, I think it's not really urban. I think the streets are too wide. The buildings are isolated modernist buildings. It doesn't make blocks and all of the other arguments about it. This is an aerial photograph of part of Stockholm across the water from Hammersby. Uh, it has streets and blocks and squares and parks and almost no throughways cutting through it. Uh, on the other hand, this part down here is Hammersby. Uh, it has too much open space. The streets are too wide. Uh, there's not a kind of integral relationship, I would argue, between landscape and, and the urbanism. And uh, it looks like right here, for example, uh, the xylem boughs of early 20th century uh, Germanic housing. Oh, not uh, sure. and, and it has buildings that uh, look like these too. Hardly an argument for an integration of architecture in the city. So um, I think the last chapter is to be written by architects, not by me. Uh, and by, by younger people coming along, uh, dealing with the issues uh, that are contemporary issues, but not forgetting about the traditional city and traditional principles of architecture and urbanism. I'm, I'm old enough that I can argue this because I am old. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to turn off the screen share and we can have an, have an argument. How's that? Well, I think the, la the last chapter might begin with a critique of Hammerby. And the critique, Hammerby is more than one thing. And it's a transitional project from modernism to what comes after modernism, to an, envir an environmental urbanism. And it's not all the way there, and not every part of it is beautiful, but some parts of it are beautiful. And one of the things most beautiful about it is the way that it takes Stockholm's traditional waterfront building typology of U-shaped courtyards that bring the presence of the water deep into the blocks. Uh, and they've adapted that and they've adapted it quite beautifully to modern architecture. And there is a, a um, theme running through it, which is the part of the landscape is directed to stormwater management. And part of it is formal landscape and part of it is naturalistic landscape. And they're put together quite artfully and beautifully and make some beautiful public spaces, beautiful places to be in and live, especially for, chil for children. So Hammerby is not the last word and it shouldn't be the last word, but it's important transition. And it's a transition that can and should embrace traditional urbanism. And I think that's the argument that is yet to be made convincingly. Well, I would agree that it's better and more sustainable than, than a suburbia of uh, detached uh, single family housing. Uh, I probably would agree that it's a kind of transitional 
piece as well. Uh, it's not that we need to go back and, <coughs> excuse me, go back and build things today that are exactly like traditional cities. There's a lot, a lot of room for uh, interpretation and expansion. I do think in Hammersby, most of the architecture, much of it is not good. Some of it is not good, let's say, to be fair. Uh, most of it is overactive and uh, it tends to supersede the urbanism. The nice thing about traditional cities is that, uh, let's say a, a city like uh, Barcelona, there are lots of um, modern buildings in Barcelona, in the Cerda fabric of Barcelona, but they are absorbed easily because the urban plan has hegemony over architecture. In other words, the, the urban realm only begins to disintegrate as you move out and architecture gets more active and takes over to be center stage instead of urbanism. And uh, I, I think you can find, uh, you can make sexy buildings within the fabric of traditional cities. Well, I think, you know, the, I'm writing the, the second of your last chapter that you need to write. And Stockholm is a very interesting case study, which is a largely, I guess, 18th century city, 18th century and earlier city that was after World War II, badly damaged by modern architecture and, and modern planning. Um, and the, after a period in the 20th century of building beautiful urbanism uh, under the influence of the arts and crafts movement, the garden cities movement, and the probably the most fully realized vision of Camilo Cite's um, uh, name of the book, the uh, city planning according to town planning city, according, to, uh, according to artistic principles. Yeah. Town building according to artistic principles. Stedebau. Um, so Stockholm is a record of different kinds of urbanism. Not all of it old, not all of it ancient, some of it ancient, some of it fairly modern, some of it extremely damaging to the earlier parts, and some of it not extremely damaging, uh, quite beautiful in its own right. Um, and it, I think it points the way. I think you, you and it both point in the same direction. Possibly. You're, you're very lucky, you know, not only to have grown up in a city like San Francisco, but to have an urban fabric within which you work. Uh, I said the other day, I think you're the most urban of the new urbanists, if you consider yourself to be a new urbanist, uh, you are at least a founder of it. And all of your buildings are in fact integrated into the city fabric of San Francisco or San Jose or wherever they are. And, and that's, you're, you're quite lucky in that regard. The city is better off for it. Um, how things transform from here on, I don't know. Whether we will be able to overcome the, um, the problems of global warming and, and the environment, I don't know. It's very hard to be optimistic when you think back to that first slide, what students are taught to do and what architects do do today. Uh, I will back up a little bit and say Hammerby is like in one sense, a breath of fresh air relative, if you think about that first slide uh, with all those sort of goofy buildings. Uh, I don't know what's gonna happen. Maybe we should, uh, it's been 35, 33 minutes. Maybe we should uh, open it up or do you have questions or? No, I think let's open it up to more intelligent questions. <laughs> okay. Well, I wanted to remind everybody to please uh, put some questions in, in the Q&A uh, and uh, we can um, uh, get to them as, as, we, um, as we can and uh, really start a good conversation. Um, 
I, I just wanted to, uh, I thought it was a fascinating point that, uh, that uh, Dan Solomon had made that uh, 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 to not be interested in urbanism is like not being interested in music. Um, I wanted to ask, how is it that many people seem to have lost the appreciation for urbanism? And if that is true, how do we get it back? By reading Michael Dennis. Well, let's say a word about that. Huh? Um, I, I think historically something happened in the uh, kind of transformation happened in the middle of the 18th century, which conspired with the transformation that happened in the middle of the 19th century to produce a, the kind of modern condition that makes it difficult to produce high level urban designs, urban conditions. In the 18th century, the transition to freestanding iconic buildings. In the beginning, it was uh, buildings like in Florence had always been uh, contiguous buildings, party wall buildings. And gradually the, the, the sensibilities transformed as society changed and there was more emphasis on the individual in society rather than royalty. Buildings accommodated that and gradually became uh, freestanding buildings like the Petit Trianon in Paris in um, 1862, I guess it was. Um, and that made buildings like us, that they, they were, we, we began to have a kind of uh, anthropocentric relationship to buildings because they were figurative like, like we are. And they had a kind of, they expressed a kind of character. They became mute, of course, in the 20th century. But in the 19th century, the middle of the 19th century, most people were born and lived their whole lives within a four block radius of their, uh, their birthplace. There was not the movement in cities that we come to associate today. But it, uh, it, uh, around the time of Hausmann, people began to move back and forth in the city, working in a different place from where they lived and cities loosened. They loosened to accommodate traffic. Uh, and as a matter of fact, in the late 19th century, most of the urban theorists like Steuben and, and others, uh, and Hausmann for that matter, urban design centered around the design of streets in a practical sense when we get the boulevards in the middle and then later on the extension of cities based on streets and they were wide streets and they became, and they were articulate streets. In the 20th century, the street went away and we were left with uh, uh, highways and detached buildings and so on. If you pick up any history of modern architecture, I assure you, you will not find uh, almost a single urban building because the focus of uh, design interest changed. And if you, when I was in school, it was Le Corbusier, uh, especially late Corb. And today, if you, again, I'm sure that every architecture student in the US has a, what we used to call a cheater book inside their drawer under their table uh, with pictures of those buildings in the first slide, thanks to Norman Crow, by the way. Um, and you can't make cities out of those things. So architecture and education, I think have to change considerably because this stuff is so embedded in our DNA at this point that we almost can't see any other way of working. Um, and, hmm. Thoughts on that, Dan, or uh, going to the next question? No, I, I share that. I, th I think that, that architecture education is crying for a major reform where from the first minute in architecture school, people are taught that they're making artifacts that are part of something larger than itself. And there's no way of looking at uh, a building other than it's in its setting. And its setting is a in its setting in time as well as its setting in place. Um, 
with the time I have left on Earth, I would I hope to be uh, engaged in some kinds of curricular reform and teaching reform about the beginning of architecture school, both the beginning and the end. We I have a friend who uh, at the University of Texas who refers to it as architect uh, educating architectural toy makers. Architectural what? Toy makers. Toy makers, yeah. Architectural toy making. And if we don't, I know when I, when I first started teaching at the GSD in 1981, uh, there was a great admonition to not have anything to do with the landscape section or the planning section or the urban design section. Uh, and there may have been a reason for that, I don't know. But more than ever, we need to know our craft, that is to say our own discipline, but we also need to, to, to know how to relate and use other disciplines, specifically landscape and urbanism and environmental issues, etc. You don't have to make bland background buildings. And here's another topic, Dan, that we could talk about. But, um, but you do need to um, see architecture as socially, formally, urbanistically embedded, that it's urbanistically biodegradable, as Fred used to call it. Uh, and, and I think education needs to be that. The schools that I, I know of very few schools today that do teach this way. Let uh, me ask the first question, uh, like a question from the Q&A. Doug Kelbaugh um, first says, good job to you guys. And uh, um, he, I agree that ha Hammaby is urbanistically flawed. What about B B O O one in Malmo, Sweden or Vauban in Freiburg, Germany? Familiar with those? I've not been to either of them. I, you know, I think there is a whole bibliography of environmental urbanism that um, Doug and Doug and Harrison Fraker, and I guess no others that I can think of, have been in the Peter process Calthorpe. of assembling. Go ahead, Mike. And Peter Calthorpe. And Peter, yeah. Peter wrote an amazingly good book called Urbanism in the Age of Climate Change. Uh, I, I don't know whether it's had an impact uh, beyond me, but it certainly had an impact on me. And I don't know those uh, projects. Um, I don't know much beyond Italy and France. <laughs> Sorry uh, about that. If somebody's asking a question from Washington, DC, and is saying that new developments are often opposed by residents who here on the grounds that they aesthetically clash with the surrounding buildings. How can we design modern multifamily structures that can fit in with existing architecture? Should we try and recreate older architectural styles or should we accept the modernist architecture? That modernist architecture is here to stay. Modernist architecture is here to stay. Modernist architecture is capable of being uh, inflected in subtle ways that make it compatible and a good neighbor to almost anything. It's not taught that way. That's right. Uh, Dan is an example par excellence of somebody who does that in San Francisco. And, uh, and there are others in the Bay, Bay Area. <clears throat> I've always been envious of this. I don't know, I, I once asked John Ellis, Dan's partner, urban design partner, how, why this is, because in Boston, we get the worst, the absolute worst uh, architecture, worst apartment buildings, horrible things. Nobody knows how to make facades. They don't generally make them urban buildings. They're more like, uh, I don't know, towers in the park. So I don't know how it happens in San Francisco, but I certainly agree that modernism, modern architecture is fully capable of making urban buildings and buildings that can relate uh, to whatever historic buildings. And uh, I mean, it's not only classicism, there are multiple styles historically, as long as they uh, 
a line on the streets and and uh, relate to other buildings, then you can do all kinds of things. Again, Barcelona is exam is an example of that. I have a friend who's a he's a former Berkeley student who's a very successful and really brilliant urban designer in Tianjin, in China, and I've uh, worked with him and collaborated with him. He's a he's a extraordinary practice where he's the 500 person office that is doing enormous projects and beautiful projects um, in, in many Chinese cities. I took him to see, a, I just we had just completed a little building. Well, it's not a little, it's 50, 50 units and a, and a uh, clinic uh, in the South of Market, uh, kind of rough district in San Francisco. We're standing across the street from this little building and he said, I'm jealous of you. I'm jealous of your practice. I said, why on earth are you jealous of my practice? Because you've got, you know, you've got uh, this dream practice building whole chunks of cities. And he says, you're living in a city that has a living architectural heritage and we destroyed ours. And I thought it was a very poignant remark about, uh, you know, mo modern building, that was a, we we're across the street, our building with some sort of sops to environmentalism with a bristly facade of sunshades. Um, but it had bay windows and it had a kind of scaling of a large of a series of aggregated lots that left the record of the old flatting of the city uh, on this new building. So he, I, I thought that was an interesting comment that I'm blessed to be in a city that has a living history. You are. Here's a question to Michael. As, as an academic, why have your colleagues been so disinterested in studying the elements of successful cities? Will they change? And if so, what will be the catalyst? Oh my gosh, that's a tough one. Um, Good one. You know, Planning, as we were talking about this yesterday, planning as a discipline, <clears throat> uh, as, a, as a profession, let's say, early 20th century, I believe, urban design really only became uh, a topic or a discipline around the 1950s or thereabouts. Uh, Jose Sert established the urban design program at Harvard in, I think, 1956. Colin Rowe established the urban design program at Cornell in 1962, or I believe. Um, planning had used to be what we refer to as town planning historically was in fact the design of cities and pieces of cities, and they didn't draw architecture. Uh, gradually planning came to be policy planning and statistical planning. It was program oriented more than design oriented. And that was reflected in most of the planning schools, Cornell, Harvard, et cetera. And at a certain point, the, briefly, the physical planners and the, and the statistical planners got a divorce and the physical planners went to another unit. And then when the economic crush came, they had to get remarried again. Um, Urban design, I believe urban design programs have more or less disappeared. There aren't very many of them anymore. And I, I used to teach at uh, MIT until oh, 2016. I taught a course about urban design theory. It's basically the chapter on temples and towns, uh, the evolution of the design of planned cities grew out of that course. And I used to tell the students that this was a course that I wish I had had when I was in school, focusing on the city and its relationship to landscape and architecture, et cetera. Uh, but I didn't. It would have saved me a lot of anguish and a lot of soul searching and a lot of romping around the world trying to figure things out. I don't think it's very much taught these days how you turn that around, I really don't know. People seem to be interested in 
uh, navel gazing and narcissistic architecture these days more than uh, certainly a relatively few people in CNU and, and others. But so I really don't know. Dan? We well, have I, think, I think it's a very, the cultural architecture is very deeply ingrained. And the mechanisms of promotion and success and awarding of tenure, uh, what counts as valued in that system is self-perpetuating. Um, and the, uh, it's not only self-perpetuating to survive in that world and flourish, get a nice cushy tenured teaching job. You almost, you, not, not almost, but you were forbidden really to engage, uh, engage with architecture other than as this sort of autonomous conceptualism. Um, and they, they breed, you know, these, these, these creatures, they multiply and they, they like their own kind. Um, and it's just really deeply ingrained in most schools, not all schools. I'd say that, you know, the two that I have some occasional relationship to Miami and Maryland are, are not that at all. And our, where the, the legacy of Corn, the Cornell Urban Design Program is still alive. So we're getting a lot of, uh, sort of academic and, and intellectual oriented questions. Um, uh, one is uh, to please tell, uh, uh, tell the audience more about the book or relate the topic to the late Jack Robertson and his ideas of American architecture and urbanism or his conversations uh, with Eisenman, the Charlottesville tapes. Are you familiar with those? And yes, that, that's like, uh, that's more than one question, right? Uh, well, it's three options. Right. Uh, well, why don't I say a word about the book? Uh, because it's easier for me than the other things. I, I don't, Eisenman and Robertson's arguments uh, are not of any interest to me. <clears throat> Let me say that uh, about a little over a year ago, in August a year ago, I was looking for uh, uh, the article about the Uffizi. Uh, this is all in the, I think, the preface of the book, but uh, it had been published in Perspecta in 1980. And after 40 years of practice, uh, you know, cu cutting out publication things to photocopy for PR and for uh, submissions for architectural projects, uh, things get mixed up. I couldn't find it. I finally found the magazine and the pages had been cut out, obviously by me to reproduce. So I thought I need to spend two or three days and gather all this stuff together so I can get my hands on it. I didn't start out to write a book. In other words, there was not that intention about architecture in the city. So I spent two days or three days and did this. And then I started looking at this stuff and I thought, mm, you know, there's, there's kind of an idea here. There's a lot of repetition, uh, but there's an idea here. And I never had too many ideas. Actually, the idea of the relationship of architecture to the city has been the one that has been primary. So I thought I should put these together in a book. And I set about doing it. And then the problems start because you have to reformat everything, right? And you have to find the illustrations. And then you have to decide, well, am I going to change these few embarrassing sentences or terminologies, et cetera. And so I, <clears throat> and then you have to arrange them. And they did, they, they happened serendipitously. They were not done in effect on request or on commission, uh, the various studies, they were done according to things that interested me at a given time. So I had to rearrange them and put them into a sequence. And then I discovered that there were things like, for example, the Venetian facade uh, 
that had been well rehearsed in lectures and classes and so on, but had never been written down. So I had to write those. And then I found a whole that needed to be written fresh, uh, new, and, and put in. So the, the, beyond the introduction, there's the piece about Florence and the, um, the Uffizi article. And then there are three about specific architectural elements, the French hotel, the London townhouse and squares and uh, the Venetian facade. And then it begins a series of uh, themes about uh, the American campus, for example, about the American town, not the American city, but the American town, which is Elm, El Elm Street, uh, basically. Uh, urbanism and the city, which seems like a strange thing, but most cities today are not urban. Uh, too many cities are not urban, I should say. They're defined by population statistics, especially in China. Uh, urban, to be urban, Diru Tadani taught me about this actually, to be urban is something else. It's a kind of composite of urban space and functions and social issues and so on. Uh, in other words, uh, that neighborhoods are multifunctional, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then there is uh, an article that I wrote with um, Alistair McIntosh about landscape in the city, which makes the argument that the relationship between landscape and the city has evolved in stages. It, in, a, in a way, it began as landscape and the city. And then in the 19th century, it became landscape in the city. And then it became the city as landscape. And finally, with so-called landscape urbanism, they, they sought to replace the city, which of course is impossible. Uh, you can't make a city out of landscape. Uh, and then there's a chapter about another book, which I have I finished a while back called Temples and Towns, a study of the form elements and principles of planned towns. That's a 500 page book uh, formatted exactly like Court and Garden. Uh, it's not yet published. I hope it will be uh, at some sometime soon, but the chapter on Temples and Towns is the introduction to that, uh, to that book. And then finally, the uh, uh, the chapter on environmental issues. I suppose in a way I would, I'm going on too long about this, but I suppose in a way I, I could even imagine starting with that, doing things in reverse. Because what Dan is talking about uh, with the argument for the, uh, the aesthetics of architecture and urbanism, uh, you could begin with the environment and go to urbanism and then go to architecture. You could do the whole thing in reverse. I don't see them as independent. I see it as a kind of seamless thing. And then there's a little piece about South Bend, which is a typical Rust Belt city that was, uh, it looks like the bombs went off in South Bend, not uh, in Europe. And you could increase the population and, and make it uh, much more livable and habitable by infilling with uh, and, and providing housing in the center of the city, even by infilling the streets. The streets in South Bend are way too wide. They can easily accommodate uh, housing buildings in, in the middles of the street, making two streets on either side. Uh, and then finally, there's a a memoriam thing about uh, my relationship with Fred Coder, uh, which was a very personal relationship. So that's about the book. Uh, that's um, actually a good segue. You mentioned landscape urbanism. We had a question from uh, Stephanie Bothwell. Please tell us more about integrating traditional place placemaking with 
with sustainable elements and perhaps even the best elements of landscape urbanism, such as its focus on revealing natural processes? Well, <clears throat> landscape urbanists are advocates for natural processes in the way that traffic engineers are advocates for the movement of, of uh, vehicles. And stormwater is very much like, it's a fluid mechanics, very much like traffic engineering. And it is as incompatible with the brittle, fragile, intimate structure of urban space as, as highways slashing through town are. So I think that, that there's a fundamental flaw in landscape urbanism, which is uh, set out as a polemic to uh, usurp and replace new urbanism with something hot and new and relevant to those who are the practitioners of it. Actually, one of the better new urbanist books is the one put together by Andrew Stwani and Emily Talon called Landscape Urbanism and Its Discontents which is a series of very intelligent critiques of uh, the landscape urbanist polemic. Yeah, I would agree with what Dan just uh, said. I, I, I can't stand these uh, cuts, like uh, MIT has a couple of these things, these uh, little ravines with boulders infested by mosquitoes and so on that's supposed to reveal some kind of natural process. Uh, it's like landscape urbanism is a, is a non sequitur. I mean, it's, uh, what are you gonna say? But not all, not all the works that call themselves landscape urbanists are, are, are bad things. I mean, there's some beautiful projects, including Chrissy Field in San Francisco with George Hargraves and Mary Margaret Jones is a beautiful piece of city, which is very much in the landscape urbanist canon if they have such a thing. Um, we had a question from um, Kelly Wilson. Uh, Fred Ketter once mentioned that Prague didn't seem to have suffered from the usual ills of modern architecture, that the modern architecture done in Prague has a way of accommodating the city. Do you know anything about this, uh, Mike or Dan, or have any thoughts? I've never been there. I've, I've been to Prague. I thought it was terrific. I, I, um... I, I really was blown away by, by Jose Plechnik's work in Prague Castle. It's as an early um, what proto modernist, he was fabulous. I have to confess, I saw Prague Castle, I saw the old part of town, I saw the 19th century part of town. I didn't see any modern building, so I can't answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why it's accommodated so well. Yeah. Uh, Brian Uluni uh, says uh, to Michael, obviously you've worked on many academic campus plans and academic buildings. What freedoms in crafting the public realm do you find that you have building buildings inside a campus environment that you otherwise wouldn't have framing a city or civic landscape? What limitations are there in the campus work? And that could also go to Dan. Wait, 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 I, I missed the first part of the oh, question. Uh, obviously he said, uh, what freedoms in crafting the public realm do you find that you have building buildings inside a campus environment, academic campus environment, that you otherwise wouldn't have framing a city or civic streetscape? And what limitations are there in campus work? Well, I think the my, my experience with campus building is that it is as bureaucratic, as difficult, as impacted by uh, the primacy of program and budget as anything. Built, campus buildings are really tough and campus environments and campus bureaucracies are really tough. And uh, you know, <clears throat> Mike's, Mike's uh, chapter on, on the history of campus planning, I think is terrific. And it documents or it, it describes as a narrative the disappearance of the campus plan as the morphological structure of campuses and the, the hegemony of the autonomous building, uh, exacerbated by donor programs where donors, donor sponsored buildings demand autonomy and demand not only uh, the celebration of the architect, but the celebration of the donor. 
uh, which is a pretty anti-urban impulse. Right. Before you talk about that, um, Mike, if, if you do, um, I will mention that we're a little at, past the hour point and we can keep on going. We can keep on talking for a little while longer. Okay, well, I, I would say there are, for me, there are two distinct periods. Uh, and I, in my office, were blessed by having a lot of work during what I would call the the good period, which was up to uh, uh, 2008. And then after 2008, things changed. Uh, before that, we, we had, we did, uh, we had the benefit of great commissions, good uh, uh, campus planning work and campus buildings. People were, it was a period in, in campus development when most campuses had sprawled after the Second World War and built a bunch of bad buildings further and further out into the landscape. And we made the argument that you can, that a campus is like rehearsal for the city and that you can infill like urban dental work, you know, uh, you can infill the blank spaces and create the spaces and the paths and the walkways and make the campus better and make it socially and academically better, that there's a fit between intellectual pursuit and the physical uh, environment. We also were lucky in that we were a, we had a kind of niche and another niche, which was we we did uh, several performing arts buildings that were high budget, uh, relatively high budget uh, buildings in sensitive locations and the campus authorities, I found to be reasonably intelligent and uh, supportive and wanted buildings that were of a certain quality and that reinforced the, the, the community, uh, uh, the, the, the physical community, the urban design community, let's say. After 2008 and the economic crash, university architects became more interested in self-preservation and, and cheap buildings and cheap plans uh, than anything else. They were less interested in uh, providing a what I would call an urban fabric, a kind of campus fabric. Uh, and donors also wanted more uh, what we would call goofy buildings. They wanted signature buildings out on the edge of campus, you know, that scream with the owner's name uh, on it. And you can imagine uh, all of the things that went on, the names attached to those, uh, to those buildings. So uh, we found ourselves losing out our hit record in interviews went considerably down and to firms that we had never competed with before like Canon or SOM uh, for campus plans and things. Um, our, our percentage of success dropped precipitously. And now uh, I'm not optimistic. You, you, you look at the magazines and you see the things that are getting built on campuses and they're, they're like the first slide that I showed more or less. Um, so uh, Michael Leodakis, uh, um, no, Lacutis, I'm sorry. Uh, the world has embraced a culture of consumption and waste by making buildings that will not last and are not adaptable. Even so-called green buildings are often made of impermanent materials. What role do Michael and Dan think durability, the use of local materials and principles of construction should play in making cities and their buildings? Um, and would you consider your positions traditional or modern? <laughs> Mike Lacutis, damn you. <laughs> is this a Michael Lacutis question? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I think durability and materiality are, are immensely important. And one of the principal measures of sustainability should be longevity. Uh, there's no, nothing less green than putting a three year old building in landfill. Um, 
but that's an uphill battle. And I think that, you know, the, the it relates to the campus planning question is that there's a tension, uh, an unresolvable and unresolved tension between the hegemony of the facilities manager and value engineering, which is like ripping the hearts from maidens as a, as a ritual. <laughs> um, on, on the one hand, and the, the legacy of, of um, American urbanism, the good American urbanism through the 1930s, um, and the, the good legacy of campus planning, where the buildings of the 1920s and 1930s are built out of enduring materials um, and a very high level of, of skill in their assembly. So we're in, we're in a mixed culture with tensions uh, pulling us in unresolvable directions. Uh, and, you know, the, I always, uh, you know, have commented on the similarity between the great days of WPA in uh, as the, the best building of public, public infrastructure in the history of the United States and um, the public works of fascist Italy, um, both of which turned to traditional building crafts as a way of generating employment. Part of the WPA was not to use advanced building technology in order to do things with, with inefficient hand labor and create employment. Part of the inefficient hand labor was masonry and metalwork, um, brickwork, tile, uh, the traditional crafts that made the American public buildings uh, of the 1930s uh, and the most enduring ones. <clears throat> so we're now <coughs> in a situation where um, Hardy plank is considered a luxury material um, because it costs five dollars a square foot more than than the cheapest non-range screen stucco. So we're you know particularly on campus buildings, but also for almost all of our low-income housing, we're pushed to the lowest of the low common denominator of building craft and materials, and we're rage against it, but but somewhat impotently. Well, yeah, you know, um, <coughs> Boston, uh, I was talking to Diru yesterday about this. <clears throat> in Boston, the standard way of making uh, housing these days, apartment buildings or condo buildings, is uh, one or two floors of steel or concrete, sometimes with shops and, and or uh, parking uh, in it, and then four or five stories of wood framed uh, housing units. That's not Boston, that's the United States. I suppose, but it's worse here, I can assure you. Uh, and they are colossally ugly. Uh, they, part of this is brought about by the city and the, some of the planning agencies. Oh, you need to break up this facade. You need to uh, change materials every 20 feet, you know, so you get these patchwork things, hideous, hideous things. And uh, those are private developer buildings. The same thing in a way exists with public buildings like post offices, for example. One of the best buildings in my hometown was a, was a Beaux-Arts post office building made of limestone with uh, bronze fittings, et cetera. Uh, and today, well, even uh, a number of years ago, they built a new post office and part of the idea is that even if it costs a certain amount of money, it has to look cheap because we don't want, citizens don't want to think that the government is wasting money on uh, limestone building, right? So the idea is that it, it has to look cheap too. Uh, I don't know what you do. I don't know how you overcome these things, actually. I'm gonna ask one last question. Um, and uh, this, this brings us back to both environmentalism and the United States. And uh, it seems that in the US, economic, political, and cultural systems run contrary to fostering well-planned cities, especially while fossil fuels are cheap. Is there any hope for change on the scale that is needed? <laughs> 
Well, I'd like to hope that uh, environmental issues will change that. But let's go back to the idea of the American Constitution. And if you imagine Thomas Jefferson's uh, plan for the University of Virginia, the lawn surrounded by these individual pavilions, it's like a, a literal drawing, a literal, literal physical representation of the Constitution of balance, and this is fundamental to American culture historically, that there was a balance of civic responsibility on the one hand and private prerogative on the other. In other words, you don't have, the, we have a lot of freedom, but you don't have the freedom to go around killing people, let's say. You have a, you have a responsibility to stay within ba certain bounds of private freedom, not to hurt or affect other people. Gradually that transition from a balance somewhere between Louis XIV on the one hand with this kind of total societal control, the balance of the US constitution, and then a, a, an extreme emphasis on the private realm in our time, you see it all around you today that we have the right to do anything that we want. We have the freedom to do anything that we want. And that's reflected in our physical environment. If something doesn't happen to precipitate a change, it's not going to come internally. I know that it hasn't happened yet. So it's not likely to happen voluntarily. I'm hoping that uh, if we manage things properly environmentally and socially and politically, then we may be able to get back to a kind of balance between private freedoms and, and public or civic responsibility. But there's no guarantee of it. We may be toast. Well, let, let me uh, try to make an answer. Michael makes the point in the book that to be a pessimistic architect is an oxymoron and that, that you're obligated to have a kind of optimism uh, or nobody will uh, ask you to do anything because why, why head there? But the conditions against which optimism is put includes, what is it, 65 million homeless. Uh, the fact that it costs 800 to $900,000 per unit to, to build supportive housing. Um, and the uh, simple investment in the public good of the universal wearing of a $2 face mask uh, has ripped the country apart. So if um, how we get to the point of a generation of building that is as grand and as enduring as the buildings of the WPA uh, seems like a, a very, very tough sled, sledding. Uh, we still keep doing it. I mean, we're still at it. Uh, the frustrations are no less, they're more. Uh, but the sense of optimism that might, one must try and rail against the, um, uh, our fates uh, is just part of what we do. Well, with that, I think I'm going to, um, I'm going to thank um, our panelists today, um, uh, Michael Dennis uh, and Dan Solomon. This was a really wonderful discussion. Um, I think we set a high bar for the Authors Forum going forward. Uh, you know, we're going to have, uh, I guess, 12 of these over the next 12 months. Um, I wanted to thank everybody who joined us today, and we had a pretty good uh, group of people uh, of, in, um, out there uh, listening to this and asking really good, great questions. Um, if you like this, uh, please sign up for the next um, Authors Forum in, in, on the park bench, which is uh, December 8th, and, and go to our website and, uh, uh, and look up the uh, on the park bench page, and you will find uh, the uh, um, the place to click to sign up. And once I would, again, I would just try to in, in interject a plug for C. Peterson and Barbara Luttenberg's be equally beautiful book to yeah. uh, 
uh, to Michael's book, and it's a companion piece, and it's really superb. Space and anti-space. Right. Yes. Um, well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank, you uh, thank you, Dan. It, if you have anything more to add, uh, you can add it, but otherwise we'll sign off. Is lunch going to be served afterwards? Um, <laughs> absolutely. Stay on and I'll pass it to you. <laughs> okay. Rob, thank you and thank you for yeah. organizing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great thing. Take care, both of you. Yeah. It's great. Bye. Thanks, everybody.